like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the book of Titus. We'll begin reading in just a moment. In Titus chapter 1, with verse 5, we're traveling through this book of the Bible together, and I want you to pray for me, and pray for our church, that God will use this effectively in all of our lives. As we're serving the Lord in this moment, but not only serving God at this moment, but preparing our lives and our church for what the Lord has for us in the future. Titus, of course, is one of these sons Paul has in the ministry. The Bible tells us he was a partner with Paul. He was proven in Corinth to be used of God in a mighty way. And now this book of the Bible reveals to us that Paul has given him another assignment to the Isle of Crete. And the Bible says in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. What we find in the Bible tells us that it was not some simple, easy task for Titus to remain in Crete. The Bible tells us in verse 12 of chapter 1, one of themselves, meaning a member of the population among the Cretans, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. And I'm speaking to you on this subject. Stay in Crete. Stay in Crete. It's not going to be an easy thing to do. You're surrounded, surrounded by people who are liars, behaving like evil beasts and are slow bellies. Stay in Crete. And I say to you that staying in Crete is not just an expression from Paul to Titus. It is something for all of us. Our God is a God of order. He's created a world of order. And there are many people, perhaps by the millions, who are busy trying to disrupt God's order. As a matter of fact, with such a disruption that they want this new order to become our order. But God tells us to stay in Crete and get his work done his way. For marriage, there's an order. And we're to stay in Crete in our marriages and with what God has taught us in his word. He has set in motion and in order specific things for his people. And the Bible tells us, if you'll hold your place here just for a moment and turn with me to 1 Timothy, in chapter 3 and verse 15, but if I tarry long that thou mightest, mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And here God is instructing through the apostle Paul, the young man Titus, to go to a very difficult place on the Isle of Crete and to set in order what needs to be set in order. Because establishing a church there will be the way to provide the pillar and ground of the truth for all people. I don't think anyone realizes the value of the local assembly. 
like here should recognize the value of the local assembly. A Bible-preaching, God-fearing church can help everybody in every way they need help. It can help a father be a better father, a mother be a better mother, children be better children, professional people be better at their task. The local assembly of baptized believers voluntarily joining themselves together to carry out God's commands can help everyone as the pillar and ground of the truth be more of what God wants them to be. So I say to you, with this expression, stay in Crete. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Stay in Crete. And Paul says to Titus, you're there and you have a job to do. Stay in Crete. I want you to consider with me, just as a preliminary thing, some of the pitfalls that we're going to face if we stay in Crete. Hold your place here and turn with me, please, to the gospel according to Matthew to what God says to us as the Lord speaks to his own in the gospel according to Matthew, the 26th chapter. And in this period of time when the Lord is in agony in the garden before his crucifixion, the Bible says in verse 40, and he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And if you're going to stay in Crete, if you're going to stay at what God's given you to do, if you're going to stay with the divine order God has given things, then recognize that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you're going to face temptations to succumb to those weaknesses. There's no doubt about it. I want you to look with me, please, in the book of Acts. A verse that has become my life verse in Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. And it worked its way into my life because of the temptations I faced to leave Crete, whatever Crete was for me. And God wanted me to stay at what he'd given me to do. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse 42, and daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They ceased not. And those words have helped me to stay everlastingly at it so often. To cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Turn with me please to the book of Acts chapter 20. Paul is bidding farewell to the Ephesian elders and he gives them much counsel in chapter 20 of the book of Acts. But I want you to find your way to verse 28 just for a moment because if you're going to stay in Crete, whatever your creed is, whatever God's assigned you to do, the Bible says in verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Notice, please, take heed therefore unto yourselves. While you and I are complaining and griping about what other people are doing or not doing, we're apt to succumb to our own weaknesses. And God says, take heed to yourselves. You must stay in Crete, stay at it, stay at your marriage, stay at your task, stay at what God's given you to do. Stay in Crete. And if you're going to do that, you must take heed to yourself. There's no doubt about it. Again, in Galatians chapter 6, in the context of what God says in the opening verse, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. What great temptations lie there. And the Bible says in verse 9 of the same chapter, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap 
if we faint not. Stay everlastingly at it. When you're growing weary, when you think I can't take it any longer, I can't stay here any longer, I can't stay in this marriage any longer, I can't stay in this church any longer, stay in Crete. Because God says, when you're growing weary in well-doing, not evil, but in well-doing, as you're growing weary in it, remember, as you stay everlastingly at it, in due season, in God's time, you will reap if you faint not. We need that, don't we? We need it. Look again with me, please in the book of Hebrews to what God tells us about our eyes upon the Lord in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, verse 3, Hebrews chapter 12, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Why consider him? Why look to Jesus? Why keep your eyes on him? Consider him, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. There's every reason in the world to quit, to give up, to throw in the towel. How many times we grow weary? Even saying things to ourselves that shouldn't be said to ourselves. I'm just so tired of this, so weary with this. God, help us to stay in Crete and do what God has given us to do. Just to consider because it's tough there. God didn't call us to do the easy thing. Not every assignment is a simple assignment. But if it's what God's given us, we must stay at it. You're going to find that reasons to quit, reasons to give up. I wasn't the pastor of this church three months, three months with every dream imaginable in my heart till some powerful person confronted me and tried to convince me I shouldn't be here. Wasn't there three months till that happened. Cornered me in a room and gave me a tongue lashing about certain things. And I had to get beyond that. I'm telling you, it doesn't all come up roses. God challenges you. God builds something in you to help you be able to stay in Crete. My heart is broken right now over a young couple who's decided they're going to throw in the towel in their marriage. Like they were the only people ever had anything to deal with. No, if you're going to take two people and become one person, you're going to have a lot to deal with. Just stay in Crete and stay everlastingly at it. Whatever you're tempted in, wherever you're weak, when your spirit may say yes and your flesh says no, whatever, in whatever, just by the grace of God, Stay in Crete. God has done an amazing thing to design our lives in days. And he says, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And he gives daily strength for daily needs. And you'll find it's always too early to quit because God could have given you strength for that day even before it closes. Before the sun sets and you lay your head down for another night's rest. Even if the night's rest doesn't come like you want it to come, God will refresh you with the dawn of another day. I'm just trying to say to you, 
stay in Crete. As we return to the book of Titus and see what Paul and the inspiration of the Spirit of God writes to Titus, I want you to remember that he's on this island place. He's alone with people described as fierce, evil beasts, liars, slow bellies. And he's been given an assignment. He must know himself. He must know his own temptations. He must understand his weaknesses. He must keep his eyes upon the Lord. But I want you to see in the scripture here the cause, the cause. Paul says, for this cause left I thee in Crete. And then he gives it to us. For this cause. Remember the cause David had when he came upon the scene of the Valley of Elah and the nation of Israel was pitted against the nation of the Philistines. They'd come up with some concocted rule that winter would take all. And after the Israelites agreed to it, they sent a giant down in the valley to taunt God's people. And it just happened that one of those tauntings was going on while David came from his home to check on his brothers. And he heard the giant speaking. And as he came, he wondered what in the world's going on. And as he began to question what this giant was doing, who is this uncircumcised Philistine, David's own brother? And by the way, it's hard when your family turns on you. It's hard when someone you love dearly is working against you when you're trying to do God's work. Oh, I thank God for my precious wife standing by my side all these years, standing with me, propping me up on my leaning side many, many times. But David's eldest brother said, I know why you're here. You're just a little spoiled brat. You just want to see the battle. You want to just view what's going on. And you know how the story ends. But it really starts when David said, is there not a cause? Isn't there something bigger than you and bigger than me? Isn't there something greater than your dreams and ambitions? Is God in this for this cause? And the same terminology is used here when Paul writes to Titus and says, for this cause left I thee in Crete. And let's look at the cause for Titus in Crete. Notice first he says that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. It's never easy to set things in order. Never. We must have a pattern. And the pattern is given to us in the New Testament for the New Testament church. The Lord Jesus established the church. He loved the church and gave himself for it. He shed his own precious blood to establish the church. And he gave us truth. He left the church doctrine, that's our beliefs and teaching. And he left the church ordinances, that's things he ordered that we do. And so Paul said to Titus, there are things that are wanting that need to be set in order. And people would say, amen, brother, set it in order. But the amens don't come as quickly when you're involved in being one of the people that has to be set in order. That's wanting. That's out of line with God. Are you and I willing to allow the Lord by his spirit to work in our lives and his word to reprove us and correct us and instruct us to set us in order? I remember coming here so many years ago and I had a vision and dream God gave me for this church. I shared it often back then, not so often since then, but I wanted a church not just to say we had a church 
but I had a, a dream to have a church that could reproduce itself with other churches. This is what God had given me to do. And that's not an easy task. A church of churches, a church that could be duplicated, a per church that could be purged of things and willing people, please listen, a church that could be purged and equipped and instructed to allow the Lord to work in it. For men and women to say, I want to be a part of that. I want God to use me. And I'm praying that we'll continue to do that. The Temple Baptist Church is not just a church. It's a church that starts other churches. It's a church that trains people. We're going to talk later about what people have to be and what people have to do if they're going to lead in a church. And those aren't easy concessions for some people to live to or to adhere to. But when you, when you know God has given you something to do, it happens. And when Titus arrived among these fearful, evil beasts, liars, his task was to be used of God to create Christ's likeness, to set the goal of Jesus Christ in the local assemblies there. This is what is to be considered in the cause. Notice the way God spells it out for us. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. Imagine the preacher looking at something and the pastor looking at something and saying, this isn't the way it will please God. If it's going to please God and be reproduced in other churches that will please God, these things have to be set in order. And we give those considerations. Remember the Lord Jesus said to the shepherd in John chapter 10, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, they might have it more abundantly. And so when we take on the assignment of pastoring and leading a church, we want people to have life, but we want people to have it more abundantly. And many people that you're ministering to don't have the desire to have that abundant life. They need to see that it's available to them. So what does it cost? Verse 11 of John 10 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd give us his life for the sheep. There's nothing more you can give than to pour out your life for the sheep. And that's what we're trying to do by God's grace. And that's the assignment we see that Titus has in a difficult place to carry out that assignment and to set in order the things that are wanting. This has to be adjusted. This has to be changed. This has to be made differently. And the transformation begins to take place. How does God change your life? How does the Lord speak to you through his word? Does God speak to you in soft tones? Can he speak lightly in those soft tones and you and I hear him? Or does it take more severe tones to get our attention? Do we think everybody else needs instruction and we need none? There's always people like that. But when we take heed to ourselves, we understand that we also need to be changed and to be what Christ wants us to be. That was the cause in Crete for Titus. Then notice he puts an and here. And, and ordain elders in every city. Ordaining elders. People say to me, the greatest need is for local churches. I say, no, you're wrong. I'm sorry, but you're wrong. The greatest need is not for local churches. The greatest need is for pastors in those local churches. 
to be the pastor that will please the Lord and seek only to give God his ear and heart to say, Lord, thy will be done. You can have hundreds of churches represented by buildings spotting the land, but if every one of them doesn't have a God-fearing, Christ-following, Christ-honoring pastor, it's not going to get anywhere. The important thing is the pastors. Now, when I'm saying that, it sounds as if to some of you I'm promoting what I'm doing because I happen to be the pastor. No, no, not, that's not it at all. I just know that the way God is designed in the New Testament church is the pastor to lead. And if the pastor doesn't lead, someone else will try to lead. And if someone else tries to lead, they may try to lead in the manward way, not the Godward way. In the man-centered way and not the Christ-centered way. It needs a pastor who will lead in the Christ-centered way. So can you imagine? Here Titus finds himself on the Isle of Crete and he's been assigned not only to set in order in these churches, the things that need to be set in order, but to ordain pastors. That means to literally put his hands on the men that God will raise up to be the shepherds, the elders, the bishops, different words, same office, different responsibilities, but same office, to put his hands on them and to know that he's prayed and worked and struggled to bring these people along. It's a task that's time consuming, but it's what he's to do. He's to ordain elders. And who will those people be? It's to be done in every city. So there is to be a man trained by Titus. This is a part of the cause on the Isle of Crete. Trained in every city to lead the assembly. And he must stay at it. You think every once in a while he'll feel like he's failed? You think every once in a while, maybe more often than not, he'll wonder where that person is and God is directing him. The Lord is providing these people and now he's got to be keenly alert to the moving work of the Holy Spirit to see what God is doing in someone's life and know that that's a person God has chosen for his very own. And when he puts his hands on that person to say this is now the elder, the shepherd, this is that person. He's only recognizing what God has already put his hands on. You know, there's a divine call. The Lord works. He singles out and separates people. I think I know a little bit about it. I've given all of my adult life to be a pastor. Never want to be anything else but a pastor. Not an evangelist, but a pastor. A shepherd of the flock. And I've tried to learn the Lord's way in that. And people have been used of God to help me, to nurture me, to bring me along. The names of all of them I could not mention, but many of them like Dillard Hagen, Bob Norman, faithful pastors, Lee Robertson, and others who took me under their wings, so to speak who gave me opportunity, who let me preach. And you'll find me doing the same thing with young men. And from time to time, I hope you'll say, I'd like to hear the preacher, but you understand what the preacher's doing. The pastor is trying to train others. Maybe not even for here, but for some responsibility as a pastor. Giving them opportunity, assigning them responsibility. All this requires a mighty task to be performed. And that's the assignment that God gave to Titus on the Isle of Crete. So, Titus, stay in Crete. Don't get weary in well-doing. Set in order the things that need to be set in order. Sometimes there'll be rebellion against what you're doing. Sometimes there'll be harsh words spoken, but stay in Crete. And get the job done, it's worth it. And I can tell you after the long pastorate here, 
and I plan for it to be longer if God will allow me to live, it's worth every ounce of effort to do what God's given you to do and to stay everlastingly at it. So set in order. The second part of this cause is to ordain elders in every city. But there's a third part that we often would be missed. But look at the last tiny part of the verse. As I had appointed thee. We're doing this by divine appointment. And God is using that appointment to remind us of what motivates us, why we're doing it. I answered the phone calls, the investigations that were being made to me from this church years ago. I was perfectly happy where I was. As a matter of fact, I told the Lord, I'm not leaving Patterson, New Jersey in the Madison Avenue Baptist Church. I told my wife, I even went so far as to tell the church, I'm here to stay. And I found myself in Wayne General Hospital. I couldn't walk. God put me flat on my back. And I was praying, Lord, do you want me to go where there's churches on every corner? Do you want me to pastor a church in the south? I said I'd never go back. What is it you're trying to say to me? And God arrested my attention. And he said, I'm giving you a place where this college I put in your heart can be, can be built. And I'm giving you a place where young preachers can be trained and churches can be started. And I'm giving you a people who will work with you, not against you. And all those things have become things that we now are, know as history and it's worked. Our graduates have started over 500 churches around the world. Isn't that amazing? Every one of them, there's 4,000 of them so far, have come through this church. They've worshiped with us. They've listened to our music and joined in. They have their Bibles marked up like my Bible's marked up because they've listened to me preach through many, many books of the Bible. And many times when I'm listening to them preach, I'm reminded of something I said and do. I, I have this water. I don't recommend that people have it. I had an eight and a half hour throat surgery and I keep my throat open by taking a little drink of this water when I'm speaking. But they didn't have the throat surgery. They don't need the water. But guess what? They all now think they need a cup of water. I'm saying more is taught by catching it. It's really caught more than it's taught. But we see the Lord moving. And I want you to know that I'm preaching to myself in this moment. Stay in Crete. Finish what God has given you to do. The work is not finished till I'm finished with you. And we are to set in order. Take the time to say this is the way I believe God would be pleased if it's done. Set it in order. Recognize the hand of God upon people and put your hands on what God has put his hands on. But always remember that we've been given this by appointment. Someday, when my work is finished, I hope years from now, I'll have to answer to the person who appointed me. That's the Lord Jesus. And as a church, we answer to him. And we'll be thankful to God that when we got weary, in well-doing, when it was not really seasonable, we were in season and out of season, when our flesh grew so weak 
We didn't quit and leave Crete. We didn't give up on what God assigned us. We stayed in Crete and finished what God gave us to do. It's the Lord who gives the increase. We can't make it happen. It's our business to obey him. And when we obey him, it's his work by his spirit to give the increase. So we're trusting him for that. And when you're preaching through a book of the Bible like this and you come to these precious moments and passages, you just thank God that God uses it to speak to your own heart. And I say to you, whatever temptations you have, whatever weariness you're going through, don't throw in the towel. It's worthwhile. Stay in Crete and God will enable you to see the Lord someday who appointed you, who gave you that task. And we hope and pray, he says to us, well done. Let's pray, may we?